I mean, part of it is that the sanctions against Iran have caused the price of wheat in Afghanistan to go up 60%. And we're talking in my neighborhood about families huddled together on the brink of starvation. Who has some buffer that allows them to pay a 60% increase to get bread for their children? And so I'd ask women, well, what are you eating? And they'd say, well, just once a day, sometimes twice, we have the bread and tea without sugar. But the war in Afghanistan since 2001, if we just look at that chunk, okay, sort of like footnotes, $2 billion is spent every week on the United States military presence in Afghanistan. $1 million per soldier per year. How can it become so expensive? that all of these drones that are flying over Afghanistan, there are 65 to 70,000 full-time analysts analyzing the equivalent of 58,000 full-length feature films, trying to understand patterns of life in Afghanistan. Do you think maybe some of them might have noticed that the roads are roadways and conduits for 93% of the world's opium to be sent outside of Afghanistan? Might they have noticed that there are warlords and drug lords controlling those roads and that the United States military pays handsomely every day for every 150 mile stretch of road? They pay again and again and again. And that's part of why it costs $800 to fill one tank of an airborne or a landborne vehicle. $800 to fill what? I, truly, I'm not making this stuff up. Um, General, I'm sorry, Congressman Tierney of New Jersey has a very detailed, long report on this. But this is why United States taxpayers are shelling out $2 billion per week to continue maintaining the war. Some of that resource and funding goes right to the pockets of drug lords and warlords, including the Taliban we're supposed to be fighting against. And so I think about the madness of continuing the war year after year after year. I have O negative blood, and it, uh, it's very valuable. So when I show up at the Italian hospital, emergency hospital, they're always very happy to see me so I can donate some of my O negative blood. And I've gotten to know those hospital workers quite well, both um, some from Iraq and Italy. And so one is named Emmanuel Nanini, written up in a very favorable New York Times cover story magazine article about two months ago. And Emmanuel knows that it requires $1 million to keep one United States soldier in Afghanistan for one year. So Emmanuel said to me the last time I was with him, Allora, just that you let six of them go home. <laughs> and you give me the six million dollars, what I do. And he's imagining the three hospitals he could build. And then he said, you know, you send 60 home and I've got 30 clinics I can do. So uh, the, the, the allocation of the resources, of course, should raise questions. But then we have to think of the very exceedingly difficult questions about what the United States troops are mandated to do. Now, many of those troops are inside of military bases in Kandahar, in Helmand, in Bagram, and they may never even leave the base. And there may be terrific boredom, but they wouldn't be involved in what I want to describe to you related to urban combat and those who are assigned to accomplish what are called night raids. An embedded journalist, his name is John Shea, worked for a publication called The American Scholar. I mean, we're not talking about The Nation or a radio program for Amy Goodman, right? This is a pretty mainstream magazine. And he became an embedded reporter, meaning that he was traveling with the United States military. And writing about night raids, he observed, and this is his language, soldiers who talked about how their house searches had become demolition parties. They shattered windows in China, broke furniture, hurled civilians to the ground. Earlier that day, they had blown up a building. They tornadoed through Afghan houses and left such destruction that their ANA, Afghan National Army allies, at first tried to stop them 
and then grew angry and sullen. The staff sergeant for the squadron said, yeah, we definitely made some Taliban out here. It was like a week-long Taliban recruiting drive, he added. And you know what? We had fun doing it. I love recruiting for the Taliban. It's called job security. Now, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King encouraged us to have tough minds and tender hearts. And we must have those tender hearts and embrace every person who comes back from Afghanistan, particularly those who are themselves experiencing trauma. This is tough talk, but many of those young people come back traumatized just by the very reality of what they experienced, sometimes while they were doing things they talked tough about. And it's hard. I no doubt it's hard to readjust, so our tender hearts must be there, but our tough minds to say to the people who tell us that this brings us security, that we're not feeling secure. To say that it's madness at a time when we need to deal with our environmental issues with global warming. We need all scientists on deck. We need all hands on deck to really help us solve the very crucial problems we're facing so that there will be a habitable world for the children here and the children there. To say that it just doesn't work to pretend that somehow the military will create jobs. The military doesn't create jobs. And the jobs that are needed for elder care, for after school care, for retrofitting the housing stock, for creating mass transit, we could be living in paradise. But the military is, as the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King described it, like a demonic suction cup. It takes the resources and increasingly as Dwight Eisenhower warned three days before he left the presidency, beware of the unwarranted influence of the military-industrial complex because the jobs are controlled so much by the military-industrial congressional complex and increasingly also supposedly for security by a large prison security industrial complex. And the jobs that are out there for aspiring young people with very altruistic motives quite often are jobs that have to do with the military or with security or with locking people up. So how do we free ourselves from the madness of warfare? Um, I've learned a lot of late from a Massachusetts Institute of Technology professor, John Tierman. He wrote a book called The Death of Others. And he was mandated by MIT and the Lancet Medical Journal from the United Kingdom to make a report that would give as close as possible an estimate of how many people in Iraq had died after the United States shock and awe campaign began. And with very careful research and much consultation, they came up with a pretty staggering figure. 600,000 Iraqi civilians had died after the United States invasion of Iraq. And John Tierman was pretty sure that when this statistic got out, there would be an overwhelming response. They were preparing themselves for enormous media response and responses from the faith-based groups and the universities. Well, there was barely a shrug. So we face a problem that the United States government with think tanks galore has been able to market the wars by convincing people that they shouldn't get too uptight or too upset because at the end of the day, we did a favor. We got rid of the bad guy. Saddam Hussein is gone, as though there was only one person that ever lived in Iraq. Now transfer that over to Afghanistan. Who are the bad guys? The Taliban. And ought we not stay in Afghanistan? Because, oh, mercy me, we don't want to leave the Afghan women and children unprotected by NATO and the United States forces in the face of the Taliban. Now, I object. Under President Hamid Karzai, shored up by the United States and with warlords heading up every single cabinet ministry in Afghanistan, the laws that have been enshrined as legislative fixed policy 
have been a rollback in terms of women's rights that even the Taliban was not able to put into law. A woman now is such a second-class citizen, she doesn't have equal rights to education or to a job, and a husband is entitled to deny food and other resources to his wife if she is not submissive to his demands, including demands for sexual relations. Women have not experienced gains in Afghanistan. If you measure life expectancy, it's gone down from 44 years of age to 42 years of age. 42.2. It's still, according to the UN, the worst place in the world into which a child can be born. The worst place in the world for a woman to give birth to a child, a fire to heat the family home in the winter time. You know, 100 children froze to death in the past very, very harsh winter in Afghanistan. 26 of them in Kabul. These are the deaths that were recorded, eight of them in a refugee camp immediately across the road from a sprawling United States military base. And all day long, you see the convoys of trucks bringing fuel and clean water and food to the United States military base, while on the other side of the road, in the harshest winter on record, people didn't even have blankets. And the infants would slip out from under the blankets. 400 new refugees every single day displaced by the war. And what the family I've gotten to know best in that refugee camp had fled because a drone directly hit their encampment when they were goat herders in the Sangin district of Helmand province. And one man lost his wife and five children. And the brothers said, we can't stay to see if this will happen again. So they left. But also in that family, when I went in December of 2011, were a little girl, and I'd kind of huddled next to her for warmth, actually. And then her uncle came over, and he unzipped the top of her jacket and pulled it aside so that I would see that the drone had left her armless. And next to her, her brother huddled up in a kind of fetal position, his leg mangled by the same drone attack and no medicine available. He's maybe 17 years old, and they say, well, he takes opium to deaden the pain. The drones will never, ever, as they try to establish patterns of life, understand what Sekarula wants to tell us in this video. Yeah. 